Welcome to the DermVet Podcast. I'm Dr. Ashley Bourgeois, a board-certified veterinary dermatologist practicing in Portland, Oregon with Animal Dermatology Clinics. I'm also a mom of two, just trying to find the balance like everyone else. Let's learn to ditch the itch, cytology, everything, and make derm more fun than frustrating. So this is an episode that is a bit different, but some topics that I'd always hope we would eventually tackle on the Derm Vet podcast. As much as I love talking about allergies and otitis, I also love just learning to be a better human and how we can make veterinary medicine better. Better is going to be more diverse. And Dr. Courtney Campbell is a person I've respected in our field for quite a while. And we've always kind of been in communication about eventually doing something together and really supportive of each other. With the recent events, I felt the need to ask him if he would be willing to have this conversation as a black male and a white female in veterinary medicine. And he was for it. So this is a raw you know, not filtered episode of the podcast, but I think it's an important convers- conversation I'm willing to share with you guys. It it means so much to me, but it's most more importantly about the black community and how we can increase the 2% to even higher in veterinary medicine. So I just hope you guys learn as much as I did from Dr. Courtney Campbell, a board certified veterinary surgeon in Ventura, California with Vet Surge just rocking it and making such a difference in our industry. Well, hi guys. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Derm Vet Podcast. I always thought that I would bug Dr. Courtney Campbell to come on the podcast to talk about tickaboos and podoplasties. Um, but I am, I'm very honored and happy to welcome on for a very different reason, but one that we've talked about and we feel like is really important and, and we're okay to discuss and address. And that is the, the topic of, you know, racial justice and diversity within the veterinary field. And you could look at us and think, you know, we're both we seem like both very happy people. We have a lot of similarities. We're, you know, we're veterinary specialists in our perspective fields. We do a lot with different media outlets, but I am a white female and Courtney is a black male. And there are a lot of things that, especially for me as a white female, I have come to realize um, with the recent events, I have completely thought wrong. Um, I've had to adjust how I think. I've had to educate myself and it is absolutely long overdue. But Courtney was very um, gracious enough to say, let's have this conversation and let's have this conversation and record it so other people can learn from it. Because as we discussed before we started recording, it's time to lean into the discomfort and we're going to get it wrong and it's going to be messy and that's okay because it needs to happen. So Dr. Campbell, I just want to thank you so much. You probably never thought you'd be on a dermatology podcast talking about uh, race, but here we are. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Ash. This is, um, it's okay if I call you Ash, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Because I can throw in the Dr. Ash as well. No, seriously, it's, uh, the reality is by having these conversations, I think we just shed light. We put a magnifying glass on some of the daily, the daily encounters that we have. They are not separate issues. They are not that, it is not a situation in which I can say, well, this is my veterinary medical life and this is my, the veterinary medical profession. Oh, and then this is the, the parts of my life that I experience uh, racism or injustice or sho- social injustice. They are part and parcel. We, this is, uh, this is our daily lives and that you and I go through every day it, interacting with people. And so by having these conversations and shedding light onto it, you understand just how for in, at the worst is how this permeates every single part of your life, but at the very best, how people can use every part of their life or every profession to help really push for social justice. So um, let's talk about both, you know, let's talk about number one, how this literally affects veterinary medicine, right? How, what you're seeing outside, what could that possibly have to do with veterinary medicine? And then let's talk about how could veterinary medicine be a platform or be a tool in helping to 
uh, push the movement for social justice. Yeah, and, and hearing the statistic that veterinary medicine really was only 2%, 2% of veterinary medicine is black. And mm. how amazing- Speak on it, Max. speak on it, 2%. <laughs> Here's the white female saying that, but how amazing would it be to look at today, 2020, and say, you guys have been screaming this, we have been not listening, or we've been excusing it, or maybe other people will take care of it, or we support the cause, but, you know, and we'll always be there for you, but we're not going to be proactive and go learn and educate and actually be true allies, not just passive allies. Um, so how amazing would it be if we could look back at 2020 where it's unfortunate it took these events to really cause a louder movement. I know the movement was there, but to really cause it to be so loud. Um, and what if in 10 years we look back and that 2% is 15%, 20% or whatever that is. And, and we were able to truly change our profession for the better by truly diversifying it and learning from these and changing veterinary medicine. It's really possible, listen, through, through real change comes through making people uncomfortable, you know, and real change, real protests, it's not supposed to be a comfortable transition. And so if you, if you see something optimistic through this, that you, through all of this pain, through the murder of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, you know, Breonna Taylor, and the countless other names, well, when you see that, the pain and anguish from those families, her friends, um, young black males, young black females, and through this country, if there's a hope and an optimism that you can see from that, I, I agree with you. Because for what I'm seeing, at least on, in media, and this could be different than what you're seeing, I'm seeing hundreds and thousands of people gathered together, unified and protesting social injustice and racism. I'm seeing this, these protests persist for 12 days. I'm seeing a broad coalition, young, old, white, black, doesn't matter your pronoun or sexual orientation. There are people out there who are so moved to speak out, so moved to want to see change. And so if that's true, if what you're saying is true, that through the, this anguish and pain, there is sort of a, a, a reckoning a sort of a reconciliation, I think that that can really happen. But I also think before that can happen, you do need to talk, uh, you do need to tell the truth. You do need to really shed some serious light on disparities, injustices, racism. And once you have that truth, then I personally believe then that reconciliation can come. But I often feel that too often we're looking for the reconciliation part, but we haven't even told each other the truth, you know? And part of that truth is what you literally just mentioned, that um, United States is roughly 13%, 14% of the population, but we, you know, comprise 2% and have never been above 3% in the veterinary medical profession. And you know, there's headlines like in 2013, the Atlantic pr printed an article called veterinary medicine is the whitest profession in the United States. Mm -hmm. And there are some who bristled at that term. Why? They're like, whitest profession. I find that to be insulting. Uh, it, I had nothing to do with the fact that the profession is so white. But that headline, although it did what it was intended, grab your attention, right? That headline was really speaking to the homogeneity of the veterinary profession rather than you know rather than using the term white they could have even used the term homogenous uh because it is they feel that article was just describing the fact that for the most part it all looks the same and if you aren't comfortable with the word white we can talk about that later but let's say for example you'd prefer not to and you use the word homogenous then that's still something that i think that needs to be worked on because i think that Veterinary medicine should reflect the rich diversity of pet parents in the United States right now. You know what I mean? So for me, that, that's really the bottom line. I mean, you could talk about the widest profession, meaning that there's systemic injustices, um, systemic uh, the education being devalued or being relegated to blacks being relegated to live in certain areas so that they couldn't pursue higher education. I mean, if you look at just the first human medical school, I believe it was founded in 1765, 
And the first time blacks were allowed to go to medical school was like 1868. And the reason I bring up human medical school is because as you know, veterinary medical school sort of mirrors that trajectory. But I mean, a hundred years later, you're now, you know, blacks are allowed to enter medical school. And then you add on to those years where, like I was just saying, through a practice of redlining where you have African-Americans relegated to certain areas to live and they can't pursue higher education. So I, I think the word white certainly it certainly alludes to the fact that there's a systemic issue and a, a, a problem with the infrastructure. But to a larger perspective, even if you don't want to focus on the word white, the word homogenous also fits too because it, veterinary medicine shouldn't be homogenous. I've met some amazing pet parents of all different races, ethnicities, young, old. I mean, millennials are driving right now the, the um, pet parenting in this country, right? So, uh, and millennials are increasingly diverse in who chooses to become a pet parent. So I just think it's a, it's a beautiful thing. So that, sorry to be so long-winded, but that's truly the way I feel. I see truth, but I also see optimism at the same time. No, please. Like, this is exactly why we did this, was that the conversations have to happen. And we have to be uncomfortable. And that's what I'm learning. You know, and I think a lot of it is just truly not educating ourselves. And I could speak for someone who's, I truly feel like one of the stereotypes of the problem, like me, like I, you know, coming up upper middle class, white female. Um, I know in a lot of industries, female would be considered, you know, I understand like there's issues in, and I've had some challenges to come over as being a female. Um, but being in situations where, um, you know, my upbringing and I was always taught to be a really nice person and I would never do that. Like I would never say anything racist. I would never, I would, one of my best friends in high school was black. Like I, you know, would always feel like I would stand up for her, you know, if something was said to her. Um, but I was never really proactive in understanding the whole problem. Like I lived in my bubble, right? Like suburbia, um, I grew up like military bubble and I never really educated myself like what redlining was or why those, those social changes can have such a long-term effect. Like, you know, I would think, well, I see friends that are successful and they're black. I see, you know, different segregations in certain neighborhoods, but I certainly see people who are doing well and, but not really. So I watch 13th and I know that's a lot of people are learning or watching 13th on Netflix now and looking at, I don't know if you've seen it, but it, it, you see the numbers of um, people in prison when they've made different changes to the law and um, and how you know black people were very much like targeted and um, put in prison. If you look at the percentages, I think it's like forty percent of the prison population is black. You just said like it's not forty percent of Americans that are black, and you mm -hmm. see the numbers climb, and you see um, the means right of an average black income versus a white income. And I'll be the first to say, see, you were long winded. Now I'm going to be long winded. <laughs> Don't worry um, about it at all. I'm I'm listening. I'm hanging on every word. Oh, um, I'm just I'm just really glad we can have this discussion. You know, right or right or wrong, it's what we feel comfortable with it, putting it out there. Um, but um really understanding like the history of it and that there truly is disadvantages in the 13th it really kind of that that documentary really kind of shows um you know police brutality and and all the thing other things that have happened but uh just basically how white privilege always sounded really scary to me like because i didn't truly understand it you know i knew mm -hmm privilege because it's upper middle class i understand there's people that that weren't um but the thought of white privilege sounded like you know white supremacy i mean i'll be honest i get images of like kkk like it's scary um and I, but i didn't research it i didn't really have these discussions i didn't really understand i just said oh well like yeah i understand that's bad i would never do that extremist stuff but um white privilege like no i i would give everybody the equal opportunity. But what I've come to realize is that white privilege just means, doesn't mean I haven't had challenges, doesn't mean I haven't overcome things, but none of it's ever been based on how I look as far as my skin. I've never, sure. you know, had those disparities against me, doesn't mean other things haven't happened. And I think you're right, like um, 
the thought of either black or white, or am I saying the right thing? Or, or, you know, what are we calling the different races now? Um, we have to be comfortable with that now. It's not going to be comfortable right now, but it has to be okay. Um, so yeah, I, it's a, it's just a conversation that's really important. And I'm just really sorry that it's taken me so long to come to this realization. And I'm really sorry veterinary medicine has come this long to that realization, but I don't know if optimistic's the right word coming out of this, but I, I hope there's a change from it. I really, I really do. And I think we all do. I, I listened to your podcast, um, with Dr. Oh, Futsal. Sweet. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, it was a great conversation that you guys had and it was before all of this stuff happened, if I can remember right. Um, and, and she's president elect, I believe, or maybe not president of the multicultural veterinary Medi medical association, but you opened the episode of that podcast with the story. And I don't know if you mind um, sharing on that, but the story you had when you went to a local uh, veterinary event. Yeah, certainly I can, I can speak to that. You said so much that I think it's so important to comment on, but you sure. know, you and you I, can comment. We can That's okay. <laughs> no, we could do it for like four hours. So I know I, uh, I'll try to stay, I'll try to stay on topic, but yeah, I really, I think all the points you brought up from everything from white privilege to that awesome documentary, the 13th to one of my best friends is black kind of me, you know, memes, all of that is important to talk about. But in regards to just how you move every day as an African American man or as a black person or a black female, every day is you are fighting sort of a, as a veterinarian, you're fighting a dual fight, right? So you're fighting every day for the health and wellness of pets and people everywhere, every day. But then the other fight you're fighting is uh, racism or I I implicit bias or injustice. And you'd say, well, what, how could that possibly have an influence on you at the same time every day. Like that seems to be almost implausible. But as you mentioned, there's countless other examples that have that I can bring up in regards to how both veterinary medicine and social injustice, implicit bias, racism, how they actually occur at the same time or fused or how they're married. But I think that that particular event or instance was was all too familiar for a lot of black people in this country. And that is for once as in my life, I would love to be mistaken for a veterinary surgeon. And very rarely am I mistaken for a veterinarian, a doctor, a veterinary surgeon. More commonly, what I'm mistaken for is, um, what I'm more commonly, it, it, you know, mistaken for is uh, food service or um, custodial engineering or those sorts of things. Again, let me be clear. All of those jobs are amazing. They have merit and those people work really hard. And it's certainly not anything pejorative or disparaging to say about those professions. But what I do think is interesting is how that tends to be the default, right? And so that's the, that is my main argument. And that's kind of what happened to me at that particular meeting. I, I remember sort of leaving work, having just been hustling and bustling. You know how the day is. It can get pretty intense, right? You're just... You're, you're really trying to see as many people as you can and help out as many people and pets as you can. And particularly if you have to go somewhere after work, then it's just a full on, all hands on deck. You're trying to do as much as you can before you get out. And so you're hustling and it's hard. And I was able to uh, get out at semi-decent time. I was still late for sure, just trying to finish up a conversation. And I grabbed my bag and um, I, I get into the parking lot. I close my door and fortunately, I see another, a whole string of other veterinarians who are kind of hustling, doing the exact same thing. Just kind of doing that half run, half walk, scoot your feet thing, because they know they're a little bit late for the meeting. And all of us are getting in there. And, um, you know, I don't look any different than any of them. In fact, I think I was just wearing like a fleece and like a plaid shirt and some khaki pants or something like that. Just looking like your average uh, overworked veterinarian. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> and uh, I get in there. and. Um, uh, you know, as vets are filing past the table, people are signing in and they stop, sign in and keep moving. Stop, sign in, keep moving. And it, when it comes to my time, I actually grab the pen. And before I get a chance to sign in, um, one of the young ladies who's sitting at the, at the table says to me, hey, I just want to let you know, I'll be sitting off to the side. So if you wouldn't mind, just bring the bread out to the side 
when you, when you, when you come out. And because I literally thought she was going to say, hey, listen, I'm the sponsor to this meeting. It's nice to meet you. Who are you? I haven't necessarily seen you before because a different sponsor comes every month uh, or you veterinarian in the area. That's what I thought she was saying. I almost didn't hear anything she said because it was totally incongruous to what was in my brain at the time. It just wasn't something I was thinking about. And so I asked her to repeat herself just because I wasn't sure I heard her right. And she said, the bread, when you bring it out, if you wouldn't mind bringing it to the side. And I just paused because I realized what was happening right there is that after seeing maybe a dozen vets file past her and sign in and maybe five more behind me, all those people she could reasonably assume or her default expectation or preconceived notion was they're veterinarians. For me, the default sort of preconceived notion is this guy isn't. Now, I'm not sure exactly, you know, why she thought that. A lot of people said, well, what were you wearing, right? Because you always want to, you know, a lot of people have this reflex to look at the person being victimized and go, well, why were you doing that, right? But I really wasn't wearing anything different than anybody else. I wasn't at the end of the line. I wasn't at the beginning of the line. I was in the middle of the line. I was attempting to sign in, doing everything exactly like how my colleagues before me were, just literally existing while black, you know, that's, that's it, you know, right? it's an expression we use. And um, I had to, I just said to her, hi, I'm Dr. Campbell. I'm a surgeon in the area. What's your name? And, you know, she, she could tell what, what had just transpired. And she did turn rush it red. She was a little embarrassed by her, uh, by the situation, what she said. And she, you know, gave some excuse, but I didn't really hear what the excuse was per se, but it didn't sound sort of cogent and, and salient. But she just said, you know, I said, yeah, I, I introduced myself and then we moved on. And I could tell that throughout the rest of the presentation that her company was sponsoring, she just felt uncomfortable. And I think that that is, it harkens back to what you and I are talking about right now, which is feeling uncomfortable in that space and understanding that this is something that African Americans experience on a, on a daily basis. And it also is, it also alludes to something you had mentioned earlier too, which is that you might look at me and you and, and we look happy and we're at, you know, we're, we're living our passion and our dream in veterinary medicine. And so what could we possibly have to complain about or what, why, how could we possibly shed light on this? And that's something else I think is really important to emphasize is that social injustice, racism, implicit bias, it doesn't really care how many degrees you have. You know, it doesn't care that you're a veterinarian. It doesn't care if you're a veterinary surgeon. You could be a nuclear physicist. You could be president of the United States. It doesn't, that the malignancy of racism doesn't care. And I think that is the, one of the most painful aspects about this situation that we're seeing play out on the news for so many African Americans, because we know that you can come from the best universities and have the most uh, prestigious degrees. You could still be a victim like George Floyd was. You could still be murdered depending upon, you know, who you're dealing with on a daily basis. And living in that fear is something that is, um, it, it, it is traumatizing. And we're now starting to, now in the, in the conversation, we're starting to talk a lot about black trauma and what that trauma feels like going through every day, knowing that just a, an, an uncomfortable interaction with the police could be a life limiting event. Uh, and that, that I think is something that I don't know if a lot of people even think about, but you mentioned white privilege. And I think part of white privilege is, is um, understanding that it, it, part of that white privilege is saying, I don't really need to have these conversations. They don't really affect me. I can put my head in the sand. I, I don't want to watch the news. Not wanting to pay attention to what's happening, not wanting to have these conversations, not wanting to in, understand what, what's currently happening in this American problem, I think is a privilege in itself, right? If it doesn't affect me, then why should I care about it? Uh, that is, a, I think, a privileged stance. And so um, that's why, again, I know we keep coming back to the same thing, but that's why I appreciate you um, putting yourself through understanding and educating yourself and looking at documentaries like that, having these types of conversations. And you're going to have a lot more uh, conversations after this. And I'm sure you've had plenty before this one. I'm only one perspective. I am by no means a race relations expert. But uh, I think that as you have each conversation, it just adds to the public understanding. I 
love your uh, long-winded answers because it's like emotional and it's just amazing. And I, you know, I um, had a conversation with Dr. Jeff Tinsley, who is one of our dermatology um, interns about to be resident recently. We were talking about client communication, but he's a black male and naturally like it was a conversation. He was the same, like he wanted to have about it. And um, I think this is exactly why you get, you can't just have this conversation once because your perspective and his perspective and black females perspective in our industry, they're not all going to be the same. It's kind of like handling this situation. Some of us are willing to be more public of a stance. Some people are really internalizing and evaluating and researching. Um, but to have these conversations over and over again, like your perspective and how you feel about it, it's like you said, not the one statement by the black veterinary population that's out there. Like we have to keep having the conversation and keep learning because we are going to have different perspectives and that's could be scary and uncomfortable, but it's beautiful too. Once we can get through that awkwardness and that discomfort, just like you were mentioning. And I just thank you for even sharing that story. I, I hope it didn't, you know, make you like relive a difficult time. But I, why I thought that was important, because when I heard you talk about on that podcast, I was flabbergasted. I was like, mm. is this still happening? Like, I look at you, and I've always been so impressed because, I mean, sometimes when we're messaging each other, your vocabulary, like, I feel like I am such this casual, <laughs> hot mess person, and you're always so eloquent and so well-spoken. And I just, like, look at you, and I'm like, I can't even, I can't even fathom like just having that initial thought, but you've lived it and it's been recent and I'm sure there's still things that are happening. And the other thing I thought was really interesting that you said, which now just clicked to me is when I said, well, I see people being successful that are black. You can't educate yourself out of this implicit bias. Like you can't, you can have, you know, you can have five doctorates. Like if you get stopped, for a traffic violation, like you, you can't say, Oh, but I'm, you know, but I'm educated. I did this. Like it is solely based on how you are just how you appear, which you didn't yeah, just your skin color. color. Yeah. Just the, just yeah. the fact that you're black puts you, you know, and, and I can't remember, but there's a really good book that just looks at all the stats and just uh, of, of that, the fact that just by the mere fact of just getting in a car, uh, and I, again, do not quote me on this. They, maybe blacks are four times as likely as to die by the hands of the police or four times as likely to get stopped by the police. We know that um, something totally unrelated to veterinary medicine, you know, blacks and whites use marijuana at the same time, but blacks are much more likely to get arrested and incarcerated for it. So these sorts of implicit biases, you're right. Like it really doesn't, it doesn't matter who you are. And, um, you know, you look at and you say, well, how, and I, I think that that's really important to emphasize because I've certainly had that experience from a lot of my Caucasian colleagues where they're like, well, why would you even think like that? Why, why would that even enter your mind, you know, that idea of a racial bias? You're a veterinarian. You tr as, if, as if somehow it, becoming a, a professional transcends the idea or transcends the malignancy of racism. It, it, it really doesn't. Uh, it may, it may cause people to, um, it may legitimize a, a conversation if, if I'm coming to you and let's say you're inherently uh, biased against people of color and then you hear the word doctor in front of it, that may cause you to be a little, and lend a listening ear. It may cause you to be a little bit more circumspect and, and, and focused and, all right, what is this person saying? But at the end of the day, uh, if you don't know titles, it's not like we walk around with a badge of identification, right? Saying that we are doctors or medical professionals because you don't walk around like that. They have no idea and it shouldn't matter anyway. Everybody should be treated regardless of your profession. I think you should be treated as a human, right? And, and that's really what this is about is when you say, when you see people saying black lives matter, what they're saying is please see us as human. We're not saying that they matter any more than any other life. They're not saying that all lives don't matter. But what they're saying is that there is a systemic and, and uh, specific issue 
with black lives not being seen as human, being seen as uh, devalued to the point where you can put your knee on them for close to nine minutes until they die. So that, that's what that is signifying, is that there is a specific and systemic problem uh, to a particular community, not that there aren't other issues with other communities. Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense. And that is one of the things that I will totally admit for me. Like if you asked me about Black, Black Lives Matter two years ago, I would have pro honestly, like, and we're just being, I'm being raw and vulnerable because as you said, like right. we have to realize our own mistakes if we're going to move forward and change and not just right. say, oh, but, oh, but it's like, no, I did not educate myself. I surrounded myself. I mean, inherently being in veterinary medicine, it wasn't something that I had to really um, look at straight in the face as far as, you know, why that should matter to me. And I'm guilty as charged as saying, well, like, I see everyone equally. I'm colorblind. Like, why wouldn't we just say all lives matter? Like, I've, that was my thought. And what I have learned when I actually took the time, and again, it just like, I'm going to get emotional, but it just makes me so mad at myself that it took this, that it took um, deaths, that it, and we've had deaths before, but that for some reason this is different is, is, is you know, good because we want finally to, to move forward, but it shouldn't have taken this long. And as a person who does educate and always wants to be a better human and a better mom and, you know, I've always, you know, my daughter's young, she's three, but not even thinking like, talk to her about it now. Like I just thought passively, like we are nice people. We treat everyone equally, but not really thinking that I need to be proactive on that thought and say, let's get you a, a black baby doll that you can have. So you, that is not, that's something you see and you care for and you appreciate and you love. Um, mm -hmm. you know, she has some black kids in her daycare, but it's not very many. I mean, we're in the suburbs of Portland, Oregon. It's a very predominantly white area. And, but I wasn't being proactive and educating myself. You know, 13th is not a new documentary. It has been on Netflix right. for a couple of years now, but Absolutely. I've only recently decided, oh, I need to educate myself. So it's my own fault. And I totally thought that way. And now I, it's just, and I'm sure it's been because of the push and the movement um, being so strong on things like social media and, and, and conversations are happening and it should have happened a while ago, but now I very clearly see why that is it's black lives matter is not all lives matter. Now it's very, I understand, I understand I have white privilege and I understand like, um, it doesn't mean that I did something wrong. It doesn't mean, you know, I should, I, you know, I probably have had implicit biases, but I need to recognize that. Like just because I'm not one that would go out and do something harmful or I would say something bad, I have to actively like work on my mind. I have to actively educate myself. I have to actively teach myself these things and have the conversations that are uncomfortable. Like, you know, when I messaged you and I was scared to message you, but to have those conversations and put it out there for the people who are willing to, everyone's different. Um, but to actually process that and now it's just, it's like, so I shouldn't say clear because there's probably so much I'm messing up still. And, you know, I'm starting to read all these books and I'm starting to, you know, follow a lot more people in the medical profession and in, in media that are, that are black and just hearing the different views and platforms. But that is a long witted way to say, I told, yes, I totally see why black lives matter is different than all right. lives matter. It was never meant and to I, be like that. No, I'm 100%. I think that's important to recognize too, that like not every black person is an expert on this, right? I certainly right. don't purport or, or advance myself or yeah, propose to be one. You know, I don't, I don't advance that idea that I'm some sort of racial expert, but I also think it's important to talk about that experience, right? Like for, for you as a mom, you know, I would of course look to you right to understand what motherhood's about more than myself because you know I, and I'm, so my point is like that experience of going through that does lend at least your own personal expertise if you want to call it that a personal anecdotal expertise but then understanding stats figures institutionalized racism systemic racism uh social injustices i think that's a next level and that's something that i really applaud you for taking 
um, you know, taking the reins on and really putting yourself through a self-motivated educational experience. I think this is a moral moment in this country. And I think that everybody has caused, it, I think this has caused everybody to look at themselves more critically. It's caused me to look at myself more critically, our profession, veterinary medicine more critically. And it's inspired hope in a lot of people. And to me, hope simply just means hoping that your tomorrows will be better than your today's. But it's not a faith as in, I know it will be. I'm still hopeful that a lot of people will uh, be like you who will put themselves through this education, this American education. But I'm also hopeful that I'll continue to do the same. And I'm hopeful that people will be more like you in the sense of not just rejecting racism, but really focusing on how to be anti-racist. And that is part of, um, that's part of the journey. You know, I think a lot about how does, how does somebody become anti-racist? And you brought up a lot of the points, right? You, you're placing your children in areas and situations in which there's a diversity in front of them that more represents what they're going to see out in the country rather than the first time they leave Oregon, maybe, you know, they're like, wait, wh who is that? And you're like, oh, that's a black person. Like, I've never seen one of those before. And what happens, you know, does it come off in the rain? Or So my point is like that idea of, of seeing a black person before a certain age is just so important. You know what I mean? And understanding and how to be around black people and what the culture is like, what different cultures are like. And then also understanding that we're not monolithic either, right? Not every black person is going to listen to this or be interested in this or speak a certain way and understanding the rich diversity within the black culture. You know what I mean? So that I think is a, a really important point too. So I just applaud you in terms of education, because, you know, focusing on being anti-racist and, and also understanding that all of us, including myself, most importantly myself, are humbled by these experiences and are continuing to learn, you know? Yeah, and, and it's gonna be active, right? Like, I think that's the other thing is, right now it's like we all dive in and hopefully and educate ourselves, but there's gonna be more books written, there's gonna be more education out there. As you said, though, there's, there's a really large emphasis and power about it right now. There are people not listening. There are people that are still rejecting that and different viewpoints. And if it's not just, you know, I don't, I don't want to call it like a fad, but like if it's not in a month or two of all of a sudden, it's not as recent, it's not as, you know, I don't want to say popular because it shouldn't be popular, but it's just the events time happens and we're all kind of worried, like, is it a bandwagon? And the only way we can really prove to not be on the bag wagon, which I talked to Jeff Tinsley about was time like you can't really prove it until it's five years and you're still willing we bet we come back and have the same podcast conversation and say you know what's happened the last five years until you're willing to keep saying that you can't just like we can't in two weeks say well that was a really cool moment but let's go back to business as usual like the only way you can prove that you're not on you know this bandwagon is it, you're forever changed. Like your life changes. Yeah. You're still, you're still willing to read the books in five years, 10 years. You're still willing to read the resources that we get more people, um, in leadership positions that we offer more opportunities, um, to our young veterinary students who are black, that we get more black veterinary students in the schools that we provide those opportunities and scholarships and really just elevating that voice. And it just, I was always kind of bothered, like, how do I prove I'm not on the bad bandwagon? Like, how do I prove this really changed me? First of all, it's not about me, and I shouldn't be worried what people think about me in this situation, right. which I get mad at myself for even thinking that, right? It's like, when I asked you to come on, well, she, of course she's having a podcast now with a black male because of everything going on. People, yeah, people are going to probably think that, but it's, that's, so what? Like, after what everything the black population is going through, my biggest concern is, Oh, everyone thinks I'm just on the bandwagon. Well, right. you know, five years, I'll still be here. In 10 years, I'll still be here. In 20 years, 30 years, like, I will still be there. And right. that's, and I have to keep educating myself, not just dive in for two weeks, get really excited about it. And then, and then I go back to life as normal. So, well, that, you know, that is the whole point of protests, right? That is right. the whole point of protests is to dramatize the moment so that action, real action can be taken, right? And so it is one thing to protest, it is one thing to make people uncomfortable, it's one thing to shed light on a situation, but then what comes after that? What action comes after that? And if, 
the protests happen and you don't have conversations about it, or if protests happen and you aren't using your platform to, uh, your pla you, did, you were not moved to change, you were not moved to have conversations like this, then those protests didn't achieve their end game for you. They didn't achieve that, that actionable change for you. And we're all trying to make change in our regard. Of course, we talk a lot about the voting booth, making change at the voting booth. We talk, I think one of the most powerful ways to change is by raising good anti-racist people, which you're currently doing in your life. Right? I think all of these uh, ways that we exact change are, are helpful and we all do it in our certain ways. So nobody should shame you into who you have conversations with. Nobody should shame you in how you choose to exercise change. Nobody should shame you in how you feel or what you say uh, if, you're really tr if you have a really good heart and you're really trying to understand a particular issue. Because really that, we're all in this journey together. We're all understanding this together. And I think that's kind of how you and I as doctors, we look at how we could even look at racism. Is that you, would have, you and I have heard for, throughout this pandemic is we're in this together, right? Which means we're marshalling all of our resources, all of the social intellect and, um, and talents and in, social intellect and um, innovative strategies and the, the sort of moral compass we have to protect others, which is, hey, we're going to wear masks, we're not going to shake hands, we're going to use hand, san san hand sanitizer. We're exercising all of these moral imperatives to help protect the lives, uh, you know, the lives of citizens of other people in the United States. If we could exact that same level of effort and that same level of intellectual innovation and talent towards ending racism, then that could really be an, an, incredible, an incredible moment. The same efforts that we put towards ending a pandemic is the same way we can put towards the same effort towards ending a different virus in this country, and that virus is racism or uh, inherent bias. So I think that that's um, part of that is understanding the problem. And you and I, you know, anytime we meet a, a patient or a client, we're always trying to get a good history. Right? That's what they say. You got to get a good history. When did this start? What meds have you been on? How severe it is? What's been the response to therapy? All of that history is important. And that's how you and I diagnose and treat medical conditions. So let's try and do that same thing with implicit bias, social injustice, and racism. Let's understand our history if we can. And again, I'm still learning. Let me repeat that and double underline it, highlight it. I'm still learning too. Um, and not only once we get our history, now that we've got a diagnosis, now let's focus on how do we treat it. You know, we, you and I have talked a lot about that uh, and how to treat it. But if anybody is, you know, confused, how do I, how do I get through this? You know, how do I understand this? How do I navigate through this moral moment? I don't have all the answers, but what I can say is for me, I think it's important to just simply just have empathy. I think that is the key. If you're not exactly sure what to do or you're not even sure how to feel, is I would just simply say, have empathy. Understand that there is social injustice in this country. There are people who experience racism on a daily basis. There have been historical and systemic injustices that have created these situations. And once you are, once you have empathy towards those situations, then I feel like a lot of other things can happen. But if you lack empathy, if you lack the ability to actually feel for another person and say, well, yeah, George Floyd's murder was horrible, but there's nothing else going on in this country, racism's over. That to me shows that there's a true lack of empathy and it's hard to build on that. Yeah, I, 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 100%. I, the, I love the history part you brought up in, in relating it to veterinary medicine because, you know, I, as a dermatologist and as a surgeon and as a general practitioner, like I think a lot of people listening can relate to that. And I actually love that you brought it up that way, that history is so important that, you know, we, we talk a lot about the treatment and what do we do to fix that? And we'll probably, you know, end the next um, section and we could talk for hours. We'd probably put out like a six hour podcast if we could. Um, but I would. Right. We're in for it. We'll just have to do like big seminar where everyone listens to us gab the whole day. Cause I'm just, I'm just emotional and just absolutely loving everything. And you're, you're deciding to put forward, even though you don't have to, but, um, 
I just love the fact, and I think that is where it clicked for me, is the history, because we can talk about what we need to change, and that's amazing, and we should. We can talk about the things going on right now, but it was truly like I watched, I mean, I've talked about it a lot, but I watched 13th, and then I watched Everybody Just should Mercy. watch it. Everybody should watch it. Yeah. Everybody should watch it. And all of a sudden, it was, and I was already in that space of, oh my gosh, how, you know, I've already, it wasn't the first thing I watched, but then all of a sudden it was just like this fire in me, like, holy moly, like I have missed the, I've missed the boat on this. Like I didn't even know to that depth. I didn't even know the legal depth. And when they say systemic, we understand that systemic is a medical term. Like I understand the meaning of systemic, but I never thought about it. Like I never really thought about, I just like, it's weird, but for me, I imagine like all these veins and going deep into your body. And then it's like all the little branches, right. Of everything coming off. And you're going to know that better than me. Cause you cut those <laughs> things open, but <laughs> I just think of like all these capillaries and all these things branching off. And I was like, that's what systemic is. It's, it's all the little branches. It's all, it's the deep part, right. It's the deep history. And, yes. and when I watched that and I was like, this is not like a today issue. And this is not a yesterday issue. This is like a, decade, 50 year, 100 years, several hundred year issue. And just because we're not living back then, like we're still seeing the effects of that, but in different ways. And a lot of things have been, you know, masked from us or they've been there and we just haven't taken as white people, we haven't taken the time to actually go do the work. Like it's the stuff's sure. there. So you can find anything online to educate yourself, but mm -hmm. a lot of us haven't done the work. So yeah. I will totally agree with you. And I love that point that history is everything in, in, our, in medicine, right? So why isn't it everything and learning something about social issues, something as important as race? So I love that. Like, yeah, I just encourage everyone to actually look at the history because then you'll realize just because it was, you know, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, whatever, like these things started happening, it, the effects of that are now. And yes. And I think that, I think to your point in, the, in terms of really understanding the definition of systemic, that is exactly what it means. And we're not talking one or two bad apples here. We're not talking about one or two people like, oh man, I can't believe he said that to you. It is that idea of understanding the systems. And sadly enough, shortly before George Floyd murder, you had someone who clearly understood this systemic uh, nature of the situation and her name was Amy Cooper in, in the in the uh, Central Park who yeah. had called uh, the police on Chris Cooper and what she said was her exact words were I'm going to tell them that an African-American is attacking me obviously it was not true he wasn't attacking her. it wasn't just a man attacking me. He said I'm an African-American man Amy Cooper was uh, acutely aware of the systemic way that that the systemic view of African Americans by law enforcement. She understood that the law enforcement African American have a very tumultuous and tense relationship in general, just speaking in the aggregate, not between each, each individual. But that understanding that system and understanding how insidious it could be, she understood that to use it for nefarious means. Versus what you're saying is, I'm trying to understand systemically why this happens, so that I can use this on a daily interaction, you know, in, in my life where the rubber meets the road. And so once you understand that 30,000 foot approach, what's happening, then on your daily interactions, you can more clearly, clearly be, um, you know, clearly have empathy, right? And understand what other people are going through. But there are people who understand that, but use it for much more uh, sinister means. That the, I, that video, like when it first came out and I just like teared up cause I just like was in shock that this was a, a very successful white female from what I understand, like, um, just saying something like that. And first of all, people with their dogs off leash in areas they shouldn't be is a pet peeve of mine. So I was right. totally on his side because I have a dog that I have to be careful around with other dogs. And I, I hate when that happens. So I was like, from the get go, like, I do that. I'm like this, you know, right. was released and, and it was like nothing that crazy that he was asking her at all. Like I do it myself. And, and then it just like the thought that how she kept saying it and she didn't put her dog on a leash forever, which really bugged me. And the dog's like flailing around and she's so focused on right. the threat. 
She's right. so focused on the threat that the dog's like flailing around and she's backing up and he's threatening my life. And I'm like, he asked you to put your dog on a leash. I right. do that. Or I, you know, maybe I'm not even brave enough to do that half the time. I just think that I'm like, please put your dog on a leash or walk away. And how she kept saying it and she kept identifying him by his color. Right. And then what I also, I've seen him interviewed by this. And what I also um, loved about the videos, as soon as she put the leash on, he's like, thanks. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Like that's, exactly. I wasn't trying to get, I wasn't trying to get anything out of this. I wasn't trying to pin you on anything. I literally just wanted you to leash your dog. And as soon as you did what I asked you to do by law, we're right. good. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because he, um, she was talking about a threat and he's the one that asked her to move away from him. He's right. like, please don't get close to me. Please don't get close to me. Please right. move back. And so he's describing all of this. And so everything from the idea of, her having her dog off leash to her lying and, and, and the mendacity of him being a threat to now weaponizing uh, law enforcement's view of African Americans against him, uh, weaponizing law enforcement against him. I mean, every level, it was just so sad and tragic, but again, all too maddeningly familiar mm -hmm. to African Americans in this country. And then you know, shortly before that, you had the Ahmaud Arbery killing and then, or a video of that. And then, of course, George Floyd. So these just happened in rapid fire succession. And like I said, it is painful. It's the anguish of the families going through those, uh, those situations. I'm hoping, like you said, that it causes a wholesale change to the way that we view race in this country, including in our own profession, right? And that's kind of what this is all about. Just two happy veterinarians getting a chance to talk about social issues, which is something that a lot of people don't expect, right? They're just like, stay in your lane, you know what I mean? You two are veterinarians. But guess what? This is our lane because right. we experience this or we have these interactions on a daily basis. And I think it's important. And, and, our, and our profession is acutely affected by this. We're not talking 10%, 15%, you know, we're talking 2%. 2% of, the, um, 2 of the, the profession is, is African-American. And people might look at that and, and say, well, aren't all minorities important? Of course they are. But again, let us, let's go right back to what you said, understanding how African-Americans were not even allowed to go to school, were not allowed to attend medical school, then we're not allowed to attend veterinary school. The, the Black experience in America is particularly unique, and that's why you and I are analyzing it through that prism. Again, not because we don't endorse diversity in veterinary medicine from all groups, all walks of life, of course we do, but uh, understanding that unique perspective from a particular group, I think is important to emphasize. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, it's it's so true. And um, even thinking about when I thought, you know, should we have this conversation and record it on the podcast, there was a part of me that's like, besides one episode I did about being a mom, this is a Durham podcast. Like it right. is a Durham podcast. So all of a sudden, you know, there's going to be some episodes talking about this. But the reason I said, you know what, I'm just going for it. And there's going to be people who don't understand it. And there's going to be people who analyze something that I probably said wrong or however we handled it was wrong. The reality was, is that veterinary medicine, like we're all, it's, it's big, but small. We're all pretty tight knit group. And, and a lot of us, we um, like our work can be our life. Like they're all integrated. Like you said, it's sure. not like separate. It's not like, well, you know, I'll talk about, I'll be an anti-racist on my off hours. Like, you know, not <laughs> yeah, exactly. At, I'm not That's at work. so funny. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be anti-racist after I leave work. It's like, yeah. no, it's like, it happens every day and you're right. It is risky. You know, you and I could lose followers not like that matters per se but you know what i mean like it is it is professionally risky sometimes to talk about sensitive issues so uh, i think you and i are both kind of wading into that water but uh yeah i love the way you put that just because uh your dog has a dermatologic issue or your dog uh needs surgery that doesn't mean that somehow racism could take a back seat you know they're all together yeah so Again, we could just talk forever and I don't even like want to cut us off except for I want to respect your time. And I know eventually I'm no going to be problem. called to go to daycare. <laughs> yes, no I have to do that part. But Dr. Courtney Campbell, yes. what do we, so ending this, we talked about the importance of knowing the history. We've talked a little bit about the treatment, but what do we do in veterinary medicine? How do we move forward? And I, lots of different opinions. I totally understand you're not speaking for the entire black veterinary community. But from your eye, 
you know, what do I do as a true like veterinary white ally and how do we take this profession and, and move through this? And what's the, what's not the treatment. You're, you're there's right. not no, no, you're right in the sense that I can't obviously speak for the entire black veterinary medical community, but from my personal perspective, I think that there's, you know, two or maybe even three, areas or arms that we can attack this through. And if you just boiled it down into just super generalized speaking, you've got the institutionalized or systemic issues, right? Which we talked about the percentages a bunch of times, but then we also have just regular, where the rubber meets the road, daily personal interactions, right? And as far as systemic and institutionalized issues, I always encourage people to get involved, get involved with your AVMA, make sure you're voting for who you think should be president or on the board or at your local chapters, just making sure that your voice is heard. And I also encourage other minorities and blacks to could pursue opportunities in leadership in those roles, right? So that's a side issue. We'll we can talk about that institution and systemic at a later date, but just and your personal interactions. How can you continue to be an ally? You and I talked about number one, just being how to be anti-racist, right? And making sure that you, when you see something, say something. When you see something that's oppressive or uh, mean or just racist act, that you don't just let it go by, that you don't hear some sort of stereotypical characterization of a minority group and just go, well, that's, you know, kind of funny. If it's meant in jest, sometimes you can't be, you know, too uptight in terms of jokes, but I also am particularly careful about that, like the way that jokes are made. So speak up. Also, we talked about empathy, right? And uh, just understanding what somebody else is going through. Just because you weren't in a car accident recently, that doesn't mean you couldn't be empathetic towards somebody who was recently in one and an understanding where they came from that. Um, you know, I, what I call a stereotypical, stereotypical exemplar, which is just simply somebody that you know, right? Somebody that get to know somebody. It's pretty easy to hate somebody you don't know and a group you don't know, but once you get to know them, it's a little bit easier, it's a lot easier to love them, right? And, not, and it's really hard to hate them. So there are people who uh, have one ideology and they really believe that. And then they'll meet somebody and it will completely change their world. So I would just really emphasize that. Display empathy, empathy. understand the perspective of somebody. Practice anti-racism and then of course, get to know somebody. Get to know somebody, you take a step outside your comfort zone. Uh, we, you and I just now have taken a huge step outside our comfort zone. I know that you'd probably much rather talk about derm cases and uh, me surgery, but I think that these conversations are so important to have and that is part, it's a simply one step, the first step, or maybe even a half a step in understanding the larger problem, but you can't get to all the steps unless you start with the first one. I have been way more into discovering this and having these conversations than even derm, which is a lot for me because I could talk about derm all the time. But um, yeah, I just, everything you said, thank you. Thank you for putting yourself out there. This is not your job to have to sit here and educate me on this. But the fact that, you know, I can tell you're passionate, I can tell it's emotional and like, just being willing to have the conversation, because I know everyone is different on, on what they want to talk about right now, but willing to have the conversation. And I just really hope that if this, if this conversation can even reach some people, start some spark in someone's heart in veterinary medicine, that here's us as, you know, you as a black male and me as a white female, successful in our industry and able to have this discussion and be okay putting ourselves out there and understanding that it's not safe. I mean, maybe it's safer than it was, you know, six months ago, because all these are happening, but maybe not as safe for some. Just thank you for answering my message and being willing to talk about this and for being vulnerable. And now my plea to you as we end this episode is I want, um, it's not your job. It's not your job to keep me accountable. But if there's something that I'm doing wrong, I want to be, be accountable for it. And maybe that's a plea more to my white friends because it's not your guys' job to keep us accountable. But, um, you know, I want to be vocal about it. I want a change in our industry. 
and and it's it starts now and it's forever. So, Dr. Courtney Campbell, yes. thank you. <laughs> yeah, she has been amazing. So much. Yes, yes, it has amazing. been. It's an honor and a privilege to be on your podcast. You promised me, you said, listen, in five years, I hope to not have this conversation. So you just basically committed to having me on your podcast again in five years. So I'm going to hold you to that. And um, I, uh, I absolutely love this conversation. Like I said, this is just the beginning. And hopefully this is, uh, this is a conversation that is going to be, ha be had nationwide. So thank you again. I really appreciate it. And please, I'm inviting you to be on my podcast, Anything Possible. Would you, you promised that you would do that. Is that, can I still hold you to that? You absolutely can hold me to that. And I love how you, you snuck it in. So it's on recording. And so now I, that I will be held accountable for. So a hundred percent anytime you want. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. It's time for a change. And before I even publish this podcast, you guys, I've listened to this conversation over and over again because it just really hit home. And it's something that shouldn't have taken this long to come to the forefront, but it's here now. And I just really encourage you, I'm gonna to continue to try to put resources out there, but checking out things like the Black DVM Network, like the Multicultural VMA are, is so important. And we need to increase the diversity, increase the awareness. We need to be proactive, especially as white allies. And you know, if there's anything I can do, please reach out on my platforms. Be willing to learn, to absorb, to support, to be proactive. Until the next episode of the Durham Vet Podcast, let's go make a difference.